The tranquil town of Pontypridd, better known perhaps for Tom Jones, has given birth to the biggest rock band in Britain right now. This band are also single-handedly conquering the music scene in America. They are Ponty's finest, Lost Prophets. With two million record sales to their credit and three highly acclaimed albums permanently rotated on MTV and Radio 1, Lost Prophets are known for rock hits such as Last Train Home, Rooftops and Can't Catch Tomorrow that have become anthems of a generation and secured the band's place as the most successful international act ever to come out of Wales. So how did it all begin? We met in Ponty Park in probably in 1990 and I met Ian and I met Michael and then we just used to rehearse in his garage. Um, we just did demos. Uh, and we didn't really play many shows, like one or two that, that you know, Jamie was always around for, just in bogeys, and that was pretty much the only place that would have us. We'd known Stu for, for, for a number of years, kind yeah, of, yeah. just from hanging out in, in Pondy and, just, and, yeah, and stuff, yeah. you know. And Seeing you in different bands and stuff. Yeah, and like mutual friends and stuff. And um, I was working in the studio at the time, and uh, I knew Ian. Stuart, you know, the bass player, he used to work in a recording studio and rehearsal space. And this was before he was in the band, and he said, yeah, you can use my, you know, use my space yeah, and stuff. Yeah, come up and jam, and yeah. he, he gets his head around working all the equipment. I was drunk on my mind one night, and I was like, oh, cut my studio, I'll do your free demo. I wish I didn't say that, you know, because I needed the money. But there you go, so they come up and they didn't leave. <laughs> Basically, that's what our leisure time was, rather than going out and getting drunk or going to cinema and stuff, just pretty much almost every night we just go up to the rehearsal space and just jam and write songs and, you know. With Lost Prophets then, when it, with me playing guitar and Stu playing bass, we kind of, I don't know, kind of took it a little bit more seriously at that point, because up until then, like I say, it was just like a fun thing, really. We played some show in London. Like, I don't know how it happened, I don't know how we got on it. But I think we got a demo review to someone like that and it gave it a really good review. So then they put us on this Kerrang! show in London and this, this uh, woman, Julie, um, who runs Visible Noise, just happened to be there. And we played and we were just young, messing around, we, you know, sounded really crap, but we were having a laugh. And afterwards she gave us a card and said, oh, you know, really liked you guys, if you're interested in doing something, give me a call. And we are like, oh, cool. Um, and then we just went away and just put it in the drawer, because we knew we weren't ready, you know, and then we spent like a year maybe a bit longer than a year, just writing songs. You know, we were in no rush. We weren't like, oh, we've got to get signed, we've got to get signed, you know? Because I think if we had at that point, we wouldn't be here now. And we kind of disappeared for 18 months, recorded our new demo, came back, we played the Welsh Club, and then um, things kind of spiralled from there slowly, really. I remember, like, you know, um, Ray, who now works for Kerrang. You know, I remember she always... That was like one of the pivotal things I remember her saying to me, because she was always into you know punk and she went out with Monk Dave and all that, and uh, she was always she was friends with us, but she never really liked us. And I remember her coming up to after that show, saying, "Wow, you guys are actually good," you know, it, you see, you know, and, and it was genuine, you know, I, she really meant it. Like you've actually kind of like written some songs and you're really good. Somebody told me that. People's reactions were different. You know, we sounded so different, and we like, you know, we got a lot better as a live band. And I think, you know, the rumors started from there then. And then, just as we played, people would just turn up. You know, we'd be in the most random place in the country. You know, travel to Sheffield, but people would be there. It's like, I guess, you know, word of mouth spreads really quick. So we used to make up biographies, like make up reviews, write random fancy names, and say the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, we basically all our press kit was completely fabricated. So you're basically promoting us as liars and thieves. Yeah, we're Welsh. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to... <coughs> no, we just, you know, we do what we can to get by. <laughs> by stealing and pillaging. No, you just gotta, you know, duck in and dive in. That's what I like to call it. <laughs> Wheeling and dealing. Yeah. You know, we 
got like a, book, a little booking agent. And he started putting us on shows and blah, blah, blah. And then Julie from Visible Noise, like, you know, said, I love the demo. Do you want to do something? I'm like, yeah. And that was, you know, we weren't like one of these bands. Because a lot of bands at that time were like, no, I'm holding out for a major label. Or that's not enough money to do this. And we didn't care. We just wanted to get out and play. At first, it was slow burning because we were on a tiny label with no real, you know, money or promotion. So we did it ourselves. With, you know, with, obviously with their help, they shouted us some money, but it was more just playing, playing over and over again. But like none of the magazines were that interested in us because they all had their darlings. The, yeah, darlings from like London and all new bands. I remember at the time there were all these new up and coming bands that, you know, the magazines loved. Whereas nobody really cared about us. We've been playing like to 50 people a night, every night, you know, from like November 2000 till July 2001. Then we got like a, like not a bad slot at, at Reading. This was like the August of 2001, and it was like, up until that point, we'd been playing all year, playing all these like tiny clubs and pubs and everything. And it seemed as if we played Reading, and I remember, I remember after we, we, we had played, like, you know, it was, it was, well, <laughs> It was Basically, just, it held like 2,000 people, and there was a queue for like another 6,000 people trying to get in. Yeah. And um, I remember when we played, there was like like a near riot in the tent, you know? Anarchy, wasn't it? Yeah, like nobody could get near the tent, the barriers collapsed, and it was just like the turning point, because like all the media were kind of like, who are this band, and why are all these people here to see them? Because we haven't put them on the cover, we haven't hyped them. crowd surfing from outside the tent to get into the tent as a tightly packed it was. It was, it, it was nuts. It was just one of those moments you'll, you'll never forget, you know, and it was a real turning point. It, it just went insane. The tent was falling down, the, the barriers are falling down. Yeah. It was it was chaos. It was like, it was, you, like you could hear them hammering in the, the stuff back, you know, the tent pegs back in. We were due to do leads the next day and they'd already radio ahead and told them to reinforce the barriers and I just started this mad rumour then that it was just going to be ridiculous. And that was like our first festival experience, and I think that's when Fix Under Progress went pretty mad from there on. Just after Reading, I was sending out emails and stuff like that, and I sent out a CD off to this website called the PRP, which kind of it was like a big American website, which at that point all the American A and R labels used to read just to see what was going on, and they get, they reviewed our album and gave you like album of the month, five out of five. And then it was, then I started getting emails from like Epic and Warner Brothers, and you know. Columbia and, and all these emails like, in work, which is really we're saying, hey, you know, hear about your band, you know, want to check something out? Can you send us a press kit? We're like press kit. The only one we had is like three years old and it's all made up. During the time U.S. record companies were hounding the profits for their signature, the band agreed to be managed by Peter Mensch, whose company Q Prime manages, amongst others, some of the biggest rock bands in the world, Metallica and Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> 